Welcome to another installment, our second episode. We've got Kim Robertson and Phil Rinda here today. Uh, we're talking about uh, last uh, last time was um, getting your foot in the door, uh, entering the animation industry. Now our topic is what is all about working in the industry? What's it like? Um, uh, do you guys want to uh, fill or go first? Kim, go first. Or just tell us a little bit about yourselves and uh, and uh, what you're what you're mainly known for and and what you what we do what you do. Kim, go. Go okay, for it. I'll go first. First of all, thank you, Nico, for having us here. You're wonderful. I've worked with you for a while and you are great and your enthusiasm for our industry is wonderful. And it's so fun Thanks. to share a stage with Phil Rinda, who is the best. And if you don't know Phil, you will see how why he's so great by the end of this. Oh, yeah. uh, I have been working in the animation industry for over 20 years. I started off as um, a character designer or prop designer. My very, very first job was um, in animation, uh, prop, animation proper was a prop designer on Pepper Ann. So that's how old I am. Sound off in the chat if you are a Pepper Ann fan. <laughs> yeah, and it's like uh, that, um, I know that it was probably before a lot of you guys were even born, but <laughs> Uh, it was a definite different industry back then. It was a smaller industry. It feels like it wasn't as cool it is, as it is now, so it was probably easier to get into. Um, I love people are loving Pepper Ann. That's so great. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Sue, Sue Rose was my mentor, and she was the creator of that show. She was one of the probably one of the first and only female show creators back then, and uh, she brought me in, and um, she was great. And then I just sort of stayed in the industry. I worked at Disney TV animation and Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network, um, and I was I was a storyboard artist on Phineas and Ferb for the long, for my sort of the biggest that was the the show I was on the longest. Mm -hmm. and then uh, my last job I was supervising director of Amphibia, which I hear is airing its second season starting next month. Yay! And they just got picked um, up for a third season. I know, so yeah. good, so <laughs> happy. Um, but now I work with Phil on the. I turned in my stylus and I'm working on the um, the supportive uh, side with Phil at Netflix Animation now. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I want to mention to everyone that uh, Kim and I met. Uh, she was my director on uh, at Nickelodeon. Um, gosh, that was it's like maybe six, seven, six now. years ago, maybe. Yeah. So I remember the day you started, uh, Matt Braley and I were like, I hope she. I hope she's all right with like fart jokes. Oh, I'm sorry. You think so, we can talk about beautiful. farts around her? I see and, Matt is in the room. Hi, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> that was on the Big Banana Cricket. That was yeah. just <laughs> um, uh, And uh, Phil, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Phil. Um, I liked Kim's format. So let me think. My first gig, I, I, I kind of, I think I'll claim two jobs as my first jobs. Uh, I got to work on um this game that was released on the game boy advance was kind of my first real thing i that was like a product that came out uh it was called wade hickston's counterpunch uh gba game um i animated on it and did a lot of the art direction which was super fun um uh and then i was the i was a one of the character designers on the first season of the venture brothers uh on adult swim for the first season which was awesome i um you know, learn so much working inside of a real studio with incredible talent. Uh, and I made lifelong friends in that production. Um, uh, and then worked in New York on a bunch of, on a bunch of different things, ended up moving to LA, uh, I guess like 15 years ago. Um, uh, well, I, the show I was on in New York got canceled, got shut down mid-production. Uh, since we're talking about what it's like to work in animation, mm -hmm. uh, it, that yeah. it happened. <laughs> and it was awful. You know, I'm sure we'll get into that kind of stuff. But um, but I was on that show, and uh, that was a big catalyst for me to move to LA. So I moved out to LA. I worked on the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. It's actually when I met Kim. Kim and I were at Cartoon Network at the same time, and we both drove Saab 900 S's, which are these. Super cool, <laughs> weird looking car. So we had the same car. That's how I met Kim. Uh, I feel like yours was green, Kim. Mine, Mine was, was green. Was yours red? Mine was black. I had black. a black. That's right. Oh, yeah. I had a black one. 
Uh, and then I was at CN for a long time. Uh, I, uh, people know my work from Adventure Time. I was the lead designer on Adventure Time. Uh, it was a, you know, a career defining job for me and a real dream project. I did that for two and a half seasons. Left CN, went to Disney, and I was on Gravity Falls uh, first season as the production designer, which was sort of just a title. I was really um, one of the kind of lead character designers on the show. And then I ended up kind of transitioning into a development role at Cartoon Network, which led me to a development executive job at Nickelodeon. Um, and that was like six years ago, six and a half years ago. And then I've been at Netflix for two and a half years, again, retiring the stylus, uh, mm -hmm. sort of, um, you, know, it, you know, to some degree, but um, I guess I, you know, it's funny because I don't really feel like I've retired the stylus necessarily. Mm -hmm. I just feel like my creativity is used in a slightly different way now. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I'm, I'm at Netflix helping to kind of build that, what the experience is to work at Netflix animation and, um, you know, help, help figure out what, what an animation studio can and should look like today. Mm -hmm. It's been crazy. It's been super fun. So Phil, you and Kim are kind of your sort of head honchos at, at Netflix, would you say? No. <laughs> no. I mean, you both created Netflix, right? Um, <laughs> uh, not um, head honchos. I'm, I'm not jumping into the Q&A just yet, but the very first question we got is something that I was just going to ask anyway. I mean, what's your favorite thing about, about, this industry? What, what, what makes this industry so different from any other job? I would say it's the people. I think what's so great about it is that it's kind of like the coolness and the excitingness, that's the word, of the entertainment industry, but without all the assholery, if I can say. <laughs> um, there are some, of course, but it's like in general, I think that we are all kind of like Speaking for myself, I was sort of like the nerdy kid that was drawing pictures in school, mm -hmm. and, um, and it's a lot of us, and we, um, it's, a, it's a good group of people. And I also love the idea of um, bringing your, doing your, your personal best, working, giving your best work, but then having people that you love and trust plus it. So mm -hmm. it's like, it's a, it's a collaborative thing where we all come together and one person does a drawing or, or tells a joke, and then, you work as a team to like make it even better together, which is like a really, really fun, um, fun experience. I don't know. That's one of the things I love. Um, I often see uh, students and young artists who uh, seem kind of afraid of the industry, thinking that it's filled with, because if you, you know, hear a lot about that filled, filled with jerks or filled with mean people or, you know, sexual offenders those are just the stories that get big so it sounds like it happens a lot but um honestly maybe i'm just lucky but i've met like two jerks in wow, in 10 years so uh to echo what you were saying it's really i mean it's 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 really the people almost every single person that i've met is super cool and super nice and everybody is just working on fun stuff together and making making art and making seriously just making cartoons making <laughs> fun cartoons yeah i mean I, you know i think i think people are flawed right and that's okay that's part of people um you know so any any time people are working together you have the chance of running into something but i totally agree with kim like my favorite part of this business has always been the people um you know, I love the team sport nature of it. You know, like I, I, you know, like first time getting to, you know, one of the first things I ever did was at a small company while I was still a student. And like the first thing I got to do was say like, oh, let's hire one of my friends, you know, like, yeah. and like, I didn't want to work alone. I didn't get into animation to work alone. I, you know, I, I, I was, I had a, my classmate, Mike, um, joined us and we did this kind of like little stuff at this web, web company. Um, and to this day, like, I absolutely love it. And, you know, my friends are kind of the people I'm working with. And then I've made, like I said, I've made lifelong friends almost on every project. Yeah. But, you know, 
and I don't know if this is good or bad, but it's true, is that for me, my social life and my work life really overlap. Um, Same here, yeah. And, um, and I think it's good, but it also makes it hard to stay connected with some people. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that like working in animation and being passionate about this medium and this art form um, really connects people. And mm -hmm. like, and you always will have that kind of shared passion. And, um, and I love for myself, like how much I've been able to grow and like other people influence me and my taste or show me something or I learn something from people all day long. And, um, and that part's rad. So, you know, also I think it's a, um, I, you know, I've said this before, like it is, it is the hardest possible way to tell a story through <laughs> animation. There's, there's literally no harder way to do it, um, to tell a story. And like, we all love it. So like, there's this weird pull to people who want to use this media, medium as a form of expression. Also, I mean, you know, I don't want to ramble too much, but like I could, I could talk at length about how also how not only is it so hard to tell stories, but I think it's such a pure way because an artist's hand touches everything with intention. And like that doesn't happen in, other, in, in many other mediums, um, especially for a team. Like, you know, thinking back to like watching, you know, Looney Tunes cartoons and seeing even today with the new Looney Tunes cartoons, like you see artists in every drawing in every frame. And it is like, you know, I don't know, as that kid watching cartoons, you start noticing those little differences. And then I think that's how you kind of become part of this, this group of this peer group of, of people who love animation is when you realize you start picking up on these, these details. So I love that. Yeah. To, to echo what you started off with, uh, I, I, there, I love that there's not, uh, there's really not a lot of um, jobs that you can, you can mix your so your your uh, social life with uh, you know the people that you work with, but with animation, it's like yeah, everyone I work with is also a part of my non job life. Yeah, um, I love that 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 connection that animation gives us. Nico, pre COVID, Nico was like a great party thrower and would have oh. us all over to his apartment to watch movies and always saying, like, hey, it's my birthday or something, and meet in a bar. And it was always just everyone we worked with. Was really it's like my favorite thing in the world is just to. So much. Like, yeah. <laughs> my favorite thing is just organizing fun events. I yeah. just love it. <laughs> I don't um, think, you know, one other thing too, to kind of add to that, Nico is, and I'm curious, Kim, if, if you're, if you feel similarly, um, and this has changed a little bit through my career and kind of where I am in my life, but like, I kind of, I, sometimes I never feel like I'm working. And I also feel like I'm working all the time because, you know, for fun, I continue to look at drawings. I, I don't watch a ton of animation, but I'm, I'm a gamer, right? So I'll play games or watch Twitch streams, which like may not be exactly what I do in the day to day, but I absolutely look at it with a similar lens, you know, and I love still, you know, following artists on Instagram and seeing things I've never seen before on Twitter. Um, so I feel like I've, I, I'm immersed in animation even outside of my job. And I used to, I used to make a joke that like, uh, I'm gonna call it a joke. I don't think it's actually a joke, but because it may not be, may not be oh, funny. Oh, wow. But yeah. I used to, I used to like be like I want like in animation. Like I think about animation. I go home and I think about animation. And I, yeah. keep, I like this business. I like the arts. I like I like how it all influences. It. And I would always say like, do dentists go home and think about teeth? When they <laughs> yeah, them? yeah. But I will say, my dentist is awesome. So I asked. <laughs> I asked him one time, like, hey, and then he told me he does. He, he like, is part of these dental forums that they're talking about different. He follows things. other dentists on yeah. Instagram. And he's, like, a dentist nerd, a dentistry nerd. And I realized, like, you know what? It's not, it's about passion, right? Mm -hmm. It's, like, it's about really loving what you're doing. And, you know, and you can find ways to make it. It's, like, and that's awesome. So, yeah. You know. I found like when I was doing board writing, like just from board storyboarding from outlines where you have to write scenes, like that consumed me 
where I was everywhere I drove, everywhere I walked, it was like, where's the joke in this? Like, where's the humor? I think like animation has taught me about just find what is unique and, and funny about every situation, which has mm -hmm. been great. And that's a huge thing to take away for me with that. There's, there's so many uh, jobs and industries where it's like, as soon as the work day is over, the person's like, I don't want to think about work. I don't even want to, you know, I don't want to think about work until I go back to work tomorrow morning. But animation is the exact opposite. It's where I'm just constantly, like I said, Phil, constantly thinking about it, even after the, the, it's 6 p.m. and the clocks, you know, we punch out. But that's, that's troublesome too. Like we have to say like, it isn't all roses. Like sometimes you're just like, stop, stop thinking about this stuff. Sure, yeah. <laughs> maybe some shows that you were on that you weren't keep that excited about that you'd have to force yourself to be excited about. So mm -hmm. you know, like with every job, I think that there's like, you know, we're lucky in that 85% of it we like, but there's always that 15 that's like kind of, that's hard. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, to that, like, I would say, like, that show that I worked on in New York that got shut down was an awful television show. Like, it never got released, you know, the, the, show, got, the show got shut down. I think I'd worked on it for eight or nine months at that point. Um, and and it, it was, in, you know, and I feel bad, you know, harping on it so much, but it was terrible. It was a terrible TV show. If it ever got released, people would be like, who allowed this to get made? Um, <laughs> but my experience on that show was fantastic. Yep, I met yeah. incredible people, you know. Um, Pete Browngard, who's running Looney Tunes right now, I met Pete on that show, you know, like, and he's become a close friend, like, um, from that show uh, and on. So even, I agree, Kim, like, it is a dangerous thing that when, when, you, when we're so immersed in this, it's, it is really important to get our heads out of it. Um, it can also, you can find a passion for it, even when you're on things that may not um, check every box for you creatively. You know, I, I think just thought something that in the questions about like, how do you deal with like stress and anxiety about, about all of it, you know? And Phil and I, we talk about that a lot. Like, I don't know if you guys can tell yeah. us how to do it. <laughs> know how I deal with it. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. a journey. I mean, I think, I've, I think this is like, I love stupid, sayings and coming up with analogies and stuff but like i feel like i would tell this to some of my students at cal arts which i think uh i saw some of former students in the chat which is awesome um uh, but i feel like i've said before like you know like we've all heard that like you know you know find what you love and 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 you you know if you can do what you love you'll never work a day in your life um those statements are like you know figure out what you love and make that your job um which i love i, I think yeah. that's an awesome statement but the problem is if you love something, it can also break your heart. And mm -hmm. I think that's the challenge, right? Is that this is still a business. It's a commercial art form. It's not just you at your desk doing, you know, being this passionate artist every day. It's a job. So it can be really difficult and it can be really trying. Um, and I think as artists, there's a lot of empathy in what we do, there's a lot of love and care. We put a lot of ourselves into everything. And sometimes mm. the job doesn't want that. It wants something different. Um, and that can be really tough for yeah. a lot of people. Nico, you and I have sat in rooms where we had an idea of how a story goes and we would get notes that would be a different opinion than what we you thought. Would just completely shut down our ideas. And then our we'd ideas. have to do it and it would just be, be sitting there going like, oh, like, why? Uh, if they just it's let so us funny. do the idea yeah. that we want, they have no idea how much better it'll work. But you but gotta do it. what they say goes. So, you know, we can't, <laughs> you know, we have to say goodbye to some baby, kill some babies, I guess. <laughs> That's someone, what they say. someone in chat wrote executive notes. It's not executive notes. No, it's, that could be from the show creator. Anyone's yeah. different opinions, right? Yeah. So it's it's not, you know, I think that there's, especially for those of you that are like not in an industry and looking at it, like, you know, I think a lot of people villainize different teams or different stuff. Everyone's yeah. on the same team. Everyone wants the same thing. They're just focused on different things. And you know, navigating difference of opinion is mm -hmm. really, really challenging. And, you know, you have to, um, you have to learn how to do that. You have to, mm. you know, you have to, um, uh, 
there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of like observation and it's, and it's hard. I think it's hard mm-hmm. for a lot of people. I, I, you know, I'd also say like when, again, it's a team sport, but in school, if you're studying this stuff, it's not taught typically taught as a team sport. It's taught you at your desk, making your films, doing your own work. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, the things that get you better are not the team sport aspect. So I think it can be a real um, uh, shock to the system when you realize that like, oh, I got hired for me and my instincts and everything I do, but the job isn't always asking me for all of my instincts of what, what I would do. Yeah. And I think that's a big lesson that to navigate for a lot of people. There's eight or nine or 10 other people who are above me that, you know, uh, have a different opinion of how this scene should go. So, you know, yeah, and, you can't. And, sometimes and there's an audience. Right. Yeah. And there's an audience. And an audience. <laughs> sometimes they're right. Like I've had things where I was sure about something, like really, really sure. And, and I wanted it to be that way. And then the other person, the other opinion, and we changed it and everyone liked it so much better. And I'm like, well, you know, I guess, uh, what do I know? <laughs> you know, it's humbling. You have, it's like, that's the thing. It's like, you have to take your ego down a little bit when you're working yeah. with the people because not your opinion may not always be the best one. Mm-hmm. And then the, I, I, go ahead. I, I just want to add to that, Kim, like how awful would it be if it was the best one all the time? I know, how boring. How lonely, how boring. Like, that's not what you want. And I think it's, you know, again, I think this is where, like, your, everyone's kind of artist soul can, can, can cloud some of that because it's like, you want to be right, of course. But like, when you can get, when you can prove, when you get proven wrong or when someone can bring an idea that you never thought of, it's like, it only makes you better. It only gives you an ingredient that you never had before. Phil has given me, Phil has given me that advice a lot just in our job now. He's like, you know, I, I want you to make mistakes because it proves that you're trying stuff. You know, if you're not making mistakes, then um, you're, yeah. And I, I, I struggle with that because I'm afraid. You, who wants to make mistakes? You feel like you're going to screw it all up, but no. it really is. Sometimes there's those happy accidents too, where it's like such a bad mistake, but it ends up triggering something really funny or really good. So, you know. It's tough. And it it's, it's, seems to me like you can't really, uh, you can't, there's no better way to learn this than just to work in the industry and gain the experience. But it's like um, how you get into the industry to work to make the. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, but yeah, yeah, just, uh, I saw, I just saw someone in the chat saying, like, you know, you have to, uh, you have to pick your battles sometimes, I, you know, when it comes to, if you really feel, uh, oh, I really want to pull back on this one note, you know, like, can we please ignore this one note? Like, you know, if you really <laughs> want control over something and, uh, but yeah. Um, I, I have like a great, um, I, I got so lucky. I learned this early in my career or at least someone imparted this wisdom on me. Um, there's an amazing artist named, uh, Kano. He does a lot of like vinyl mm-hmm. toys and stuff and he's, he's worked, he's in animation. I went to SVA in New York and, and Kano was a couple of years ahead of me in school. And I became friends with him because he and his then girlfriend used to run the like Asifa life drawing sessions in New York. Okay. So I used to go after school to do life drawing and meet people in the industry. And I would go a lot, right? I would, I was there to draw, but also I met people. And I met some amazing artists there. Um, and, uh, and I became friends with uh, Kano. And, uh, and, you know, I got to know people in the business and I, was, and I finished school. And there were a lot of people struggling for work and really, um, you know, having a hard time. And Kano always had a job. And, you know, and, and I liked his real name's Danny. I'm going to call him Danny. I love Danny's drawings. But like, I don't think Danny would say he's, well, Danny would say he's the greatest draftsman on the planet, but as a, and then he'd laugh. Like, I don't think Danny would say that he was, but what Danny was good at was working. And it wasn't, um, and I guess, let me try to put it this way, is I literally said to Danny, like, how do you do it, Danny? Like, how do you, how, how can you stay employed and, and keep going? And in New York, 
there's, you know, um, there was less work. It's, it's, it's way more nomadic. It's a lot more of a rat race. Uh, and in lots of places it is like that. And not to say LA isn't that at times either. Um, but Danny was like, what I, he's like, I, people hire me because they know that, that I'm there to do the job um, and not to do what I want to do with the job. So if, if it means sometimes going against my natural instinct, I'm going to do it. Like I want to do a good job for someone versus what I think I need to do, um, which I really loved. And, and like, it's something I think about a lot and I feel so lucky because I think it's, that's about like professionalism in the workplace. And that's about picking your battles and understanding what it is you're being asked to do. And, you know, to your guys' points, like you get some notes that come in that, you know, from whomever, from a director, from a creator, from whoever, from an executive, you may like disagree, you may voice your opinion, but your job isn't to sit there and fight. Your job is there to execute a vision and that vision is a collective vision. So I love that Danny um, gave me that because I think about it all the time and it really helped me. It really helped me uh, move through the industry uh, successfully because I, I could kind of get out of my own head and it was, I can really it was letting go a little bit too. Maybe you're just like holding on to this, like I have to be my my me 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 me, and to like sort of let that go, sort of freeing in a way. Mm -hmm. Hugely freeing. It was great. Kano, look him up. What, how do you spell it? Spell it. K A N O. Okay, Kano. <clears throat> you also yeah. you also reminded me something that. I've learned uh, in the industry that I wouldn't have learned, obviously, without being in it, is that, um, and I see, and I, it was, it happened earlier in the chat, is uh, uh, a lot of people just instantly demonize executives, like, oh, executives, you know, but like 90% of my experience, usually the executive is, has a completely legit note. And I'm like, oh yeah, that is, you know, that is a good, good point. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Uh, it, it seems like a lot of people outside of the industry is are, are just kind of sort of oh the villain is immediately the executive or the I EP or whoever. What's been interesting about being now sort of on the other side of it is and sitting in the rooms where the executives are is I was so pleasantly surprised that they are really championing the yeah. show and the yeah. arts. Like they are really like. Um, that was nice. It was nice to see that it isn't like they're all in there like, ha, 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 how can yeah, we yeah, talk yeah. to them today? All just like, you know, the classic stone-faced yeah. executive with has no sense of humor and no, you know, personality. <laughs> and, you know, and like bad notes exist. Yeah. yeah. So do bad drawings, you know, <laughs> like they're, you know, they, they exist and they can both exist in our universe and, and we can still enjoy working, so... I, I love how much we've talked about. We've only, we haven't even gotten the questions. Uh, all I've asked was, uh, what, what's your favorite part about the industry? So this is, this is great so far. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, let me, I've been getting texts this entire time. Hang on a sec here. Did you text from just someone else, like not even in this thing? Uh, just, I've just been getting everyone's questions being texted to oh, me. I thought it was like your mom texting you. Or oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so yeah, their CTN is, is going through uh, the, the chat, oh, uh, picking yeah. the questions and then texting me them. Um, I'm going to comment on this last thing that someone just sure. said about yeah. demonizing major movie studios and not animation executives. Um, I, you know, I, maybe, maybe that's true, but there was this thing about only thinking about the money. And I do think that like, again, this is, was a hard one to realize is like, someone's paying for these shows. Yeah. You know? Like it is a commercial art form yeah. it feels nice. and it's really important just to remember that. And, and it's one of the reasons why I, 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 I was motivated to leave design and move mm -hmm. into an executive role was because I just kind of wanted to understand the system. Because I think when you're an artist, we learn the craft, we learn the art, we learn how to be artists, mm -hmm. you, you navigate it, but like there isn't that much curiosity about how the business works. It's easier to, to do, there's an us and them, they are the bad guys, we are the good guys. It's just easier. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. I get it. It's, it's like a, it's a world we all understand. Um, but for me, I was like, I can't believe that. Like, I want to understand the business of animation and get into yeah. there. And there aren't many artists that are curious about it. And I think the interesting thing about it is that if you are someone who wants to end up creating your own show or directing a movie or, or if that's your goal, if that's your dream, you better learn the business because yeah. you are going to be heavily part of that. And that is going to be something that you're really a big part of if you're helming a project. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to, you're going to learn it and be curious about it and ask questions. And I think not too many artists are because they don't want to be again, we talked about loving the people, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, do I love the business of animation? I kind of do, but I love the people more. So yeah. <laughs> it's, it's lower on my list of priorities. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's a cliche, but that I really strongly believe that, that um, when you start in the industry, start at the bottom and work your way up because it gets you a chance to learn how, how everything works. Uh, I've really yeah, kind of savor I that. Came in as a prop designer. It was like, I didn't, I, I had only seen this one section of the whole thing. Like I didn't even, it took me a few years to even understand like what a checker was and a timer. And like, mm -hmm. I had no idea because you're just focused on this one thing and like the pipeline comes in, you do your part and then you push it to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like, it was really great to send, to then do boards or directing or so that you can kind of get to see the bigger picture because it really is like so complicated how yeah. information is made. Yeah. I'm still learning stuff Me too. all I'm the still time. <laughs> yeah. Constantly. Whoa, learning. someone's job is that? <laughs> yeah. uh, wh while we're on the subject of executives, I don't want to jump to just the latest question, but it is on the subject from slang. Um, they, they ask, are a lot of executives former animators or people from the industry? No. Yeah, no. You know, I think there's a lot of execs that are, that come from, you know, studied creative writing or writing. There's a lot of execs that went to film school. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, you know, but that's not a prerequisite for, for executives. Um, but uh, I think that there aren't many that were, were creatives first. I can think of, you know, you know, an exec at Nickelodeon. I can think of, um, a couple. I think, I think about one of our execs at Netflix Animation who was like a business major, who is probably probably gives the best notes of anyone that I've ever worked with. So oh, yeah? it just goes to show it may not channel, maybe like in school she didn't know, but then, you know, so she found her, her the right place, that's for sure. <laughs> um, okay. All right, I'm gonna jump back to the beginning of the chat and we'll see. <clears throat> Alter, are, are, are most of the people in here are they in school or wanting to get uh, it? Hey, if anyone wants to sound off in the chat, yeah, yeah are, what, where, where are you at in your career? Are you students? Are you looking for work? Are you just starting recent, recent grad? Recent okay. grad post school yeah. looking for work? Gosh, and it's such a funny time, you know, to be Student, getting out of school right trying now. Trying to break in. A lot of people trying to break in. Yeah, I see. High school sophomore here. Cool. Oh, high school. <laughs> Just keep drawing. Yeah, draw every day, yeah. over and over our and over. That's awesome. Oh, art teacher at a public school. That's awesome. You're going to draw a hundred crappy things before you draw one good thing. Junior. Great. Thank you for... You're saying coordinator yeah. at Disney TV. Yay. <laughs> Disney TV represent. Yeah. <laughs> editor. Oh, reality editor. Yeah. Nice cross section of people. That's very cool. Self learning. Great. Yeah, that's a that's a really that's a nice variety of uh, people in the audience. <laughs> um aut auteur, auteur asks, how is the delivery of a of a final product? How's it been affected during things like uh, this pandemic? Do you, um, how are things different? Uh, that's more of our theme for next time, but we can go ahead and cover it. Uh, it what, what are the big differences you've noticed? Uh, you know, I think, right, 
people, it's a team sport, right? So typically we're all trained to be physically near people. I think mm -hmm. that um, one of the nice things is we, most productions have had people around the world working on them. So we understand how to work with people remotely. Yeah. Uh, um, but that was a big change to get into this kind of environment. Um, mm -hmm. And in this kind of environment, everything's kind of planned. There's no more like interaction between walking around or like walking to someone's desk and asking a yeah. question. That stuff's a lot harder. So that's really the big challenge. Um, it's like, how do we work with people remotely? Mm -hmm. You know, the work that's happening is incredible. Um, but I do, I will say like, you know, just to recognize like the, all of the, um, all of the anxiety and stress that, that came with the pandemic and then all of the like the you know the the stress and anxiety that's come with um, this you know this incredible focus on injustice in the world that's been happening for hundreds of years and and you know that now we can now I think more people are aware and there's a lot more um, public consciousness for good for for the better um, about it also adds a certain level of anxiety especially because everyone's alone. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I think that, you know, Netflix has done an awesome job at, at keeping things going. I think most studios have, I think, I think mm -hmm. animation, there's been a lot of news stories about like how animation as a, as a medium, as a storytelling format is one that can continue and, and, um, and, very and lucky. keep people, yeah. but yeah. that's like, it's all still inside of a pandemic, which is really tough. Um, yeah. For, it's, you know, it's hard for, to create like when I'm sure many of you feel the same like if you're sitting alone in your house and you're drawing something it's like you don't have a, your fellow classmates or teachers or co-workers to sort of like bounce ideas off of or when you're walking to go to the bathroom you run into someone and say like what can oh, yeah. I make this like <laughs> that that collaborative um energy that you get like that 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 I've noticed when I check in with with the artists they're struggling with that so Kim, yes. when you have a creative dry spell, when you were, you know, an artist, a board artist, you know, yeah. like doing that, like, what would you do? How would you oh, get through? It was great. I would, when I was a board artist, I would like just walk around in the hallway going like, oh, like that. And I would go into the writer's room and I would lie on their sofa and I'd be like, <laughs> what would you make them say here? Or I'd go into another board artist's room and say like, lie on their sofa and be like, why? can I figure this out? And like, we would eat a snack together or you'd make a joke and then you'd start to think differently. You'd get out of your headspace. I miss so grabbing like, coffee with yeah, everyone. Yeah, grabbing coffee. Like it was just, <laughs> that was the way to do it. And then now it's like, people are just alone and they're doing it to their cat or their spouse. Yeah. Like it's, does, it's not the same. <laughs> would you do the same, Phil? Yeah, it was the same. I mean, you know, I think like I'm, I'm a big, um, and I know some artists that aren't this way, but like I am very motivated by others' work. Like I love being inspired. I love seeing things that that push me. Um, now I know I, I, you know, one of my best friends like hates looking at great artwork because it, he feels like it's a, a a goal he'll never reach. So it hurts him, and that's a challenge I think is very real for people. And then I also know artists that like don't ever want to look at other people's work because they don't want it to influence them. They don't want to, they don't want to see it in their own work and both are fair, you know, but for me, yeah, I think I'm similar to you, Kim. Like I, I would get out of it, but I will say that like, I think before that, I'm also a terrible story artist. So that wasn't, you know, I, I get that problem. Um, but like for me as a designer, I would change my tool, you know? So like, you know, I would, if I was back in the paper days, I would change the way I was holding paper. Mm -hmm. or holding a pencil sorry i would i would use a different brush i'd pull out a sharpie i would do something in in photoshop if i was designing digitally i would i would pull out a different brush and attack the, the <laughs> in a different way um, and that would help me like loop, like knock some of this um uh the cement that was like stifling my brain off and would get, help me get back into the flow so mm -hmm. that's like things i would do good Fair. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, I, I think everyone's saying how it's, are you too old to get into the industry? I didn't even get into the industry till I was 30. So 
I was old then. Even, hard to believe because I'm only 39 now. <laughs> We've got, what's the, it, it, it's probably a big variety of age here in the, in the chat too. Yeah. There's a great, I know there's been some tweets I've seen go around where people have been bringing that question up on art Twitter uh, or animation Twitter. And, uh, and I've seen a lot of people talk about that. You know, they, yeah. they struggled, they were in school, they had a hard time, but then they got in super normal, you know, like, I think it's a, um, you know, it's, it isn't easy to get into the business. Um, and, it, and, and there is definitely a persistence to do it. And, um, the, the, the animation business fluctuates. Yeah. And like, sometimes it's really big and there's a lot of work happening. There's lots of opportunities and sometimes, sometimes there's it's lulls. Really small. Yeah. So like when it's small, it, the, like the skills in which you need to have go up because there's less opportunities, only the best of the best of the best, but then the more opportunities, then the, you know, like then you can maybe have a little bit less um, yeah. in the door. And you just have to try to keep being persistent and keep going for it and keep your yeah. spirits up and, and keep attacking. That, that's a fantastic point is, it seems like every five or six years, a lot of times the industry is looking for different things. Um, uh, depending on how uh how well you know a certain show might be doing and uh, you know suddenly the network is like let's all you know make new stuff that's just like this or uh, it seems yeah it seems like um it can change all the time yeah a different style that maybe was popular a few years ago so maybe the older people are getting that job because they know that's better or yeah i mean i know like um for me when i left new york uh LA was in the middle of a huge transition. Most of the feature studios had started to move to CG. So there was this influx of 2D animation talent that was like trying to get jobs. Yeah. And um, when I, I came out with my portfolio, which was like a, a very New York portfolio, it felt really different than a lot of the work that was happening in LA. And, um, and my portfolio looked really different. So. I got lucky because I stood out from the crowd because at that time, the crowd was mostly feature animation. Not true. Sorry, my kids, my kids are going crazy in the hallway. Um, was mostly feature animation people and I wasn't that. So like the fact that I was different mm-hmm. really helped me at that moment mm-hmm. uh, in time. And again, that was luck. That was not design. That was absolutely luck. Yeah, everybody, as, as I always say in these chat, everyone has a different path, a different route to how they get in. There's not, there's not one, you know, correct way to, uh, to do I, it. I also, I came from New York too. I was an illustrator. I went to school for illustration. And so I, I, I had a, my portfolio, which was an actual paper thing that I carried in, was, had a really different type of style than the, than the animation style out here. And I think it was like they were looking for something different. So it was... It, it, uh, it was good for me. Let's jump on to uh, Veronica asks, uh, what would be your advice in terms of jumping studios or maintain or jumping onto a new project when the current project ends? Hang on a sec. In- like how to do it or I think always moving from studio to studio, I think is a good thing. I love it. Yeah. I, I, I try to, I mean, I haven't worked at every studio in town, but I'm kind of on the road to, cause <laughs> I, I, I love it. I just, I love the more places I work, the more people I meet and well, we want to keep you at Netflix animation. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, over the, you know, careers last a long, a long time. So yeah. my goal is to hopefully try out everyone <laughs> at some point. It's wild. Cause like, you know, the, the they're all different you yeah know, there's like, like nuance in language nuance in the way yeah. certain departments are described little processes that are very unique to some of the studios mm-hmm. um that i i also love you know like you get to get a really good perspective on that i yeah. think like navigating your career at those moments is always tricky i think studios are, uh, across the board are trying to get better mm-hmm. at helping people navigate that um uh and from project to project, um, that is to keep to retain their talent. But like, one of the things that's great is it's a team sport, and yeah. 
you build great relationships. And I've absolutely, the, the easiest transitions that I've had have been when I've moved with some of my crewmates. Uh, you know, some of those people, um, you know, like going from Billy and Mandy to Chowder was mm-hmm. fantastic because Carl, who created Chowder, was a story artist on Billy and Mandy. We all knew each other. He brought probably 50% of the Billy and Mandy crew with him to Chowder. Um, so to like kind of go to that show and then to even watch when Carl staffed up, you know, he was on Fish Hooks. He brought a lot of those people to Fish Hooks. Mm-hmm. When he went from Fish Hooks to Harvey Beaks, he brought a lot of those people. So there's this like, there's this interesting thing that happens is like you, you come in and out of each other's orbits. Right, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's a high probability that you'll work with a lot of the same people uh, as you move from studio to studio, project to project. It's funny now, it's like, can you imagine, I mean, if this is your first animation job right now when we're in this COVID thing, and you're sure, yeah. going to lunch with everybody and sort of getting yeah. together personally, like that's hard. Yeah, I imagine it would be, it would be pretty difficult. Uh, it would be weird if, if you just got your first job right now and it's like you, you, you're not really getting to experience how it normally is and what it's, how it normally is, you know, working with a, a team in person. And like you said, go, I mean, going yeah. to lunch with the crew is important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's important to meet people and, and get to know your crew and learn how to work with people. But what's awesome, and this is like, you know, such a product of, I guess it's been around for a while, and, and I've and I met a lot of people via the web. Nico, the first time I ever knew you and your work was from Blogger, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, but Blog like, spot. Yeah, I mean, and like, <laughs> you know, watching chat and seeing people recommend things and people interact, like, this is lunch. This is yeah. lunch. You are making a peer group, and yeah. continue that. Engage on Instagram. Engage in Twitter. Like, be, be part of this community. Don't wait for the community to to yes yeah. you. Like, just yeah. be part of it. Yeah, I think I mentioned this in the last stream, but I find Twitter so helpful when it comes to finding new art, new artists, and new. Uh, people with different styles and and I mean I found my my Ollie and Scoops character designer uh, Natasha on Twitter and she was just completely brand new posting her artwork and I just liked it so much I just was like you have to work for me please and I just I I love um, yeah Twitter is surprisingly really great when it comes to finding and networking and showing off even showing off your own stuff and and getting uh uh, uh, discovered, I guess, that way. I've got to say, like, I I agree. I do miss Blogger uh-huh. because I thought that what was so cool about Blogger was it was way more conversational. Sure. And because of the way it was organized, you could really, you could really watch other people learn. Yeah. And I think Tumblr made that more difficult because it was really easy to bring other people's work into your own feeds. Instagram mm-hmm. is okay, but it's more about the imagery and not about the artist. Yeah. Um, so I do, I do, I miss that stuff. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm hoping for like another platform <laughs> to come around. That yeah. I wish blogger uh, lasted longer. <laughs> I'm the worst. I've got to get more into it. I'm just like, Oh, <laughs> I, I'm a lurker. Put it that way. <laughs> What's your Twitter account, Snoober? I always thought it was funny. <laughs> I just like it. It's my last name anagram with the, without an extra O. It's so dumb. <laughs> um, Maria asks, uh, I have the understanding that if you work in TV, you work for seasons. Is that true or, or do you just work in different projects during the year? Um, so, yeah, I think there's versions. I think we can, yeah. we can unpack that question. Every studio is different. I think that's the like number one thing to think about. Um, so there's no like true answer. I think everyone approaches it differently. Like in yeah. television, ver- very broad generalization. You'll get hired on a production, mm-hmm. and then you'll and then at the end of the season or the or the wrap of that show, you may need to find another job. You yeah. hope it could be at that studio. Yeah. Um, but it may not be, you know, like mm-hmm. sometimes it's like, that's the end of employment in features. Some places 
employ people with the assumption that they're going to work on multiple productions. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes they don't. Some people get hired for their show and then the show ends and then they're done. It's definitely, um, you know, I, there are places and there's, there's areas in the business where there may be a little bit more continuity and comfort, mm -hmm. but I definitely would say like, um, it is the entertainment business. And, and even though we're not live action crews ramping up and, and ramping down, um, I do think it's important to realize that like, it's, it is about continuing to hone your skills. It's about continuing to build relationships. It's about being a good person that people like that want, they want to work with yeah. because, because it's going to be really valuable for you throughout your entire career. People don't just get in, make themselves comfortable yeah. and then stay <laughs> forever. It's not, yeah. no place is it like that. Yeah. It's stressful. Like, like when you, when a show is ending and you have someone coming, like, here's your end date. And you're like, yeah. Oh my God. I remember we were at the one of the board artists on our show, Neeks, it was his first time boarding. And like, he came into my office and he was almost crying because yeah. he's like, wait a minute. What do I do now? So it ends. And we, yeah. had, we had hired him right out of school. He didn't know anyone except for people at Nickelodeon. And like, he was really in a panic. And I said, mm -hmm. okay, this is, this is how this job is and how yeah. you react. This is how it's going to be. So you make your choice now. Are you going to completely freak out? Or are you going to be like, okay, yeah. There are things to do. You get on the phone, you call your friend, yeah. you like you check with your artist manager, like, you know, um, and he found a job, no problem. But yeah. and because he was like a good, a great board artist and really great to work with. So, but it's stressful. It, it's, I hate that yeah. every time. Like, <laughs> it's definitely an, an industry that keeps you on your toes. Yeah. To work, unless you work on SpongeBob or The Simpsons. Yeah, or, you, know, you know, you can work on those shows for the rest of your life. Unless you work on those two shows, normally uh, after a, a, a couple seasons, you know, every year or two, yeah. you're going to be looking for the next thing because the thing that you're working on is ending. Um, a lot of studios specifically don't go further than three seasons of a show or four seasons. Um, uh, someone in the chat is asking this at a perfect time too what's the time like blah, what's the timeline like for moving from project to project um uh, i've not been able to continue on to another season of the show i was on in the past because that season just came to it was too long before it was starting and i needed to work um so i didn't have a choice to just sit around and wait for season two um i had to you know work immediately so I had to jump on to something else so I couldn't come back when that next season of that show you know started up there's no yeah there's no there's no solid answer to that question yeah. it oh. really depends you know my first gig again that like first studio gig was on the Venture Brothers and I think there was like over a year between season one and season yeah. two yeah and I got lucky I did a little bit of freelance work on season two but in that time I went back to the place I made that game and worked on a couple web games. Mm -hmm. I got hired to go work on that other show that had gotten shut down. Um, and I did that for like eight months. And then right was, as I was about to leave for LA, um, the Venture Brothers was like, hey, Phil, you're ready to come back. And it was like, I'm going to leave. I'm leaving yeah. to go to LA. Uh, mm -hmm. So I did a little bit of work from LA when I got here. But That's so, really uh, tough yeah, when there's like a year wait in between seasons. It's and it's wild. impossible to get the whole crew back. It's like going to be a completely different crew than or the season before. Is you don't get on a show and you're not working for a while and yeah. you're saving your pennies and yeah. it's rough. That is a, there is a hustle. Like there's definitely a hustle. And I think like, I'll shout out Kano again. Like you find people that you work with that, that you like that you like their approach, you like their style, style meaning like personality, you just ask them, you know, especially yeah. if you're in the business, you're just like, Everyone's how do you to call Kano. That's, that's what we're taking away from this. I'm going to post his <laughs> phone number. Uh, yeah, now I want to see his artwork. I'll never forget when I, when, when I, I could not find a job, I was losing my mind. It was so horrible where you're just like shuffle. So finally I like <laughs> shuffled to the grocery store, like in my sweatpants and like in the <laughs> food aisle, in the frozen food I like ran into someone and they're like, oh, you should call so-and-so. They're looking for a character. Yeah. It's like that kind of stuff was like, oh, those yeah. things save me every so often because 
I got to know people. You, you know, you make friends and so you, uh, people know that, that you're a person that could get a job. You yeah. Know? And, like, and again, this is like, if you're a good person, the, the spider web is that like, it's, if someone from your show gets a job, then they can open the door for lots of everyone, everyone. Yeah. Else, right. Yeah. So like, you know, and I'm, it was funny. I was just thinking about the, the Carl story, but like, I realized like, Oh wait, like on the venture brothers, the guy who was, you know, who became a great mentor of myself, this, this guy, Steven Stefano, he was a board artist on venture. He yeah. became art director on that show that got shut down. He hired me to be a designer um, on, on that, on that show. So it's like, he got me through there and then and then i and then we hired another designer from venture and some of those people because we all knew we were out of work so we all sort of moved together and this mm-hmm. was a different studio totally different type of a show even jackson uh public who was the creator of venture brothers worked on that show with me that got shut down because while he was waiting for the season yeah he helped <laughs> us do some boarding and direct to work too yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not to discourage anyone, though, that you have to know someone to get the job because there were many jobs I was on where they found someone on Twitter and loved their work or, you know, um, so it, it's possible. But it's like once you're in, it's good to just uh, don't be a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, this person who, who asked the, what was the timeline like moving project to project, um, they also uh, asked how long before the end date do you recommend looking for a new job? I usually reach out like a month before the end date of uh, whatever I'm working on. I'd say like a month and then I start. If I haven't, don't have anything lined up, that's when I start putting feelers out. <laughs> and it's, I think it's a comfort. I think it's a real comfort thing for, for yourself. I think um, it's like fishing or something, you yeah. know, you just kind of have to feel it out, figure out what's right for you. Um, you know, not, don't wait too long unless you have the comfort for it. But I will say that like, I tell everybody like, save your money, like yeah. get good at saving your money. Cause you know, A, that can't hurt. Um, but B, like, it'll give you a little bit more cushion. So you may not, you won't have that kind of anxiety. Now everyone's situation is so different. So I understand that that isn't in the cards for everybody, but mm-hmm. You have to be prepared for it. I saw someone in the chat saying, "Like, did you have to get a second job?" I think someone said that, and that has not been the case for me. But there, um, there, there was a time when I could not find a job between, and I was like, "Should I get my real estate license? Yeah. Should I like, get the job at the grocery store? Like, you know, that can happen." So I've seen it happen. So it's always good to be flexible. But on the reverse, Kim, and this is a loaded question because I know my answer is like, how many times were you doing more than one job at a time in animation? A lot. <laughs> so explain, explain what that means and for you. I wonder, does that exist anymore? Like freelance? Like, oh, yeah. Because oh, I, so. I, I was doing several jobs on one show. Even, no, no, no. I mean like freelance. Oh. Like, oh. Like freelance on top. Maybe a couple of times, yeah. There have been a couple of times that I was doing freelance, which is very, very hard. And I found, I was once, I was doing a, a freelance, a board, on a show and I was doing a freelance board for another show at another network and <laughs> I lost my mind. Like that actually I learned, one good thing is like learn about who you are as a person. Like like the amount of like money or whatever that you would get for that that was good. How I, be, how I treated my body by like my hand hurt, I stopped talking to friends. I wasn't eating proper like that. Oh wow! That like ruined me, and I really learned early on like I can't do that. Like for self care, I cannot do that. So um, I don't know. That that was one thing I learned. Like too much freelance makes Kim a very bad <laughs> lady. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I saw someone ask real quick. Uh, six months is the longest I've ever gone in between jobs. That was tough. Yeah, it's tough. That is tough. That is tough. Yeah, I can uh, jump back to some more questions. But uh, other interesting things, though, to just take off some of that edge is like in LA County, most of the anim- a lot of the animation jobs are union jobs. So your so your like health benefits aren't tied to your employment; they're tied to you as a union member. Yeah. So even in these big gaps, you can still have health coverage. Um, everyone can file for unemployment, um, you know, if you've been laid off at the end of the season. Um, so there's definitely, 
uh, there is a little bit of support that's there, but again, everyone's yeah. got to navigate. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jennifer asks, do you think storyboard artists are treated unfairly in terms of tight deadlines, unpaid work, number of duties, stress, especially today? Mm -hmm. Should aspiring storyboard artists be worried or do you have any advice? Mm. I got uh, answers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, all TV schedules are going to be tight because that's just the nature of TV. I, like, you know, I'm... I'm going to answer this in a couple of different ways. Like, uh, it's really hard work. This stuff's really hard work. I personally think boarding is the hardest job. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, hardest job. For, you know, for sure. Hands I think down, lot, storyboarding. There's, there's a lot to do. And certain productions, it's harder than others. But I think that, um, I think it's maybe the hardest job. I think that, like, there's a, there's a couple layers to the question and I'm going to, I want to unpack them because I, mm -hmm. I like thinking about this stuff is yeah. that there is like, <laughs> there is truly the problem of unrealistic workloads. And sometimes that happens. And mm -hmm. I, and I, and like, maybe I'm a hopefully optimistic person, but like, I know at Netflix, we, we, we strive to not do that to people. We don't want to give people unrealistic yeah. workloads. It's not fair. It doesn't help the shows, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to jump say, in. I've never had a problem with Netflix. It's been awesome, just so you know. <laughs> I've never yeah. had a late night. I've never had, you know, <laughs> it's been great. So Netflix, uh -huh. he's, he's telling the truth. Netflix is really uh, But, like, that. even <laughs> us, like, there are people that have had late nights. There are people who have had that. So, like, you know, I don't want to, you know, we're not perfect. And, it, and again, there's a lot that's, that's there. On, um, on Gravity Falls, I had this this kind of conversation with someone. And this is where this like commercial artist thing comes up, I think, is that uh, I was talking to someone who I love, amazingly talented artist, tons of experience. And they were, um, they were frustrated because they felt like there wasn't enough time in the schedule for them to do their job. Mm -hmm. And I heard that and I understand the, the deadline. And I said, have you ever tried to um, reduce the quality of your work to meet the deadline? Have you ever like done what it took to meet the deadline? Not about working free overtime, like really like instead of spending four hours on that drawing, mm -hmm. can you get it done in one hour? What would you get done? What does your work look like if you do it that quickly to get it to hit the deadline? And this artist was like, no, I, I couldn't do that. And like, I couldn't do that. It's not my best work. And then I go like, wait a second. What's, where's the problem? Is the problem the schedule or is the problem the, the quality of the work expectation, or is the problem that you as an artist are unwilling to do something that you feel is less than your best. And, it's, and yeah. there is no good guy or bad guy in this situation. It is a really, really complicated balance. Um, but this is where that commercial art piece comes in. It's like sometimes to get the job done, you may have to, no one wants this. Productions don't want you to reduce the quality of your work, but like, if you have to do it, you might actually prove that the schedule isn't good because this is what I, this is it. You know, this is all I can do in this time. It's not as good as it needs to be. And I think that, you know, I get like, it's hard to do that as an artist. It's hard to sacrifice what you believe. Again, we put so much of ourselves in it to like, to, to give a less than ideal version mm -hmm. to get a deadline seems like the worst thing possible, but I don't know. Sometimes you have to find a shorthand that you would find even more appealing and interesting to you. You know, there was I have like one bit of advice for young storyboard artists. This is so corny. Picture I'm like your mom. <laughs> Practice a lighter touch because I find that people that are drawing hard when they hold the stylus very firmly, you get carpal tunnel and you you can really screw up your your uh, drawing hand. So draw lightly out there. <laughs> I found, I found, uh, I worked with a number of people who, who bored smaller than you'd imagine. And like, because they boarded smaller, they actually had less distance to travel with their line and they can get through more stuff quicker. Very good. Um, oh. you know, and I know a lot of, I know a lot of like BG layout people that know to work really small because you can solve your problems small and then just enlarge them. Mm -hmm. and then finish a drawing like the hard part is is the get and it's set up for yeah. success and you don't have to work huge for that so like it's you know it, it's, it's that work smarter not harder thing um and i think that's a big piece of it 
I think it's, I think it's a real, it's an aspect that again, I don't know if people are teaching that in school. You learn that by w looking at other people. There's yeah. another amazing board artist that I worked with at Cartoon Network that like every time I got his boards, every drawing looked like he got it right on the first shot. <laughs> and it, they were so loose and beautiful and weird. Um, and I loved working on his boards. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. Um, how does he do it? And then I walked over to his desk and I watched him work. And all he did was he worked on post-it notes primarily and would draw, throw it out, draw, throw it out, draw, throw it out, draw, throw it out. And then he got the one that was right, slap it down. And like, he wasn't overworking any single drawing. He was continuing to work through his thought process in this way wow. that every drawing was so full of life because he didn't labor over them. He labored over the process, but not the specific drawing, which I was like, what, That's, you're allowed to do that? Like, <laughs> you're allowed to do that. I don't know if we answered the question about deadlines. I know, I'm not sure. I think, <laughs> do we, no. oh, we'll, I, we'll, I loved you, I loved the, how you unpacked that. I feel like Boom Boom kind of screwed everybody though, because back in the old days when I was young, we did them on post-it notes and it was sort of like, it was, a, it was like, I guess, less panels per scene. There mm -hmm. was just less panels just because it was just a different type of thing. And then Toon Boom came out and everyone was like practically animating stuff. So I feel like we need to have like a, like a industry-wide intervention to stop <laughs> doing like 11 minute episodes with like thousands of pages of yeah. storyboard. It's like, it's going to oh, kill God. us all. <laughs> that part's tough. I mean, I think digital drawing in general has made that hard. I think like for designers, they can zoom in now. Like yes. you not be able to zoom in. Yeah. So like I can, I look at, I can see it in drawings. I'm like, you're spending too much time zoomed in. You uh, I know because you go in there and you're like, but I just have to color that one pixel that's wrong. Yeah. I was looking at some of my old drawings, uh, I don't know, maybe six months ago or so. And it was like, these are so rough. These are so bad. How did I get away with this? No, but that was what it was. Yeah, it was different. Bill, your drawings are fabulous. I've done a couple okay drawings. <laughs> uh, Parker asks, uh, nice meeting you, Phil and Kim. My question to ask is, what does it take to be a great role model in the industry when I step my foot inside the door of the studio? A role model. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, thinking, yeah, I'm thinking about the role models that I've had. I loved when they told me that I was doing a good job. Like I, I worked on when they came by and were like, thank you for the work today. Like that yeah. was really nice. And, and um, I, guess it, I guess it would be just being listened to, I guess, was always really nice. Like if you mm. pitched an idea in a room yeah. and, um, and they would just consider it, consider it. And yeah. if it wasn't right, they would say, I'm not going to use that idea and here's why. And yeah. then, But it, that was always nice. It was just like maybe just someone taking the time to just mm -hmm. sort of like sit and listen to you, which was really good, or guide you in a way. Those were the best role. Oh, and like, oh, one of the best directors I had um, was always like, if we aren't having a little bit of fun, then it's not, then, you know, that that was, yeah. Yeah, let's have some fun. And if, and if <laughs> we would be like trying to like figure out this, like how, like the story would fall apart, like in the second act or something, he'd be like, let's just solve it with a joke. Like mm. we're supposed to be having fun and making jokes. Like, like, you know, maybe just relax a little bit. Don't take everything so seriously. And oh, like, man. I want to work with this story person. is supposed to be a little bit of fun. So that was always really nice. That was a good role model for I think um, I agree with all that. And I would say like, like th those people who are receptive and listening, but also like, I, I learned so much from the people who are really giving in terms of allowing me to own some of the work itself, right? Uh -huh. Like they wanted some of me, right? They wanted me to, to like have opinions and bring them to the table and allow me to help grow those shows and those yeah. and not everyone is that way and i've worked mm. on great shows with people i love that are not that way but those people that i look at as role models and kind of the people the, the type of people that i personally aspire to be it is about like open-mindedness mm -hmm. 
in allowing others to be invested and to, um, to, you know, and allow them to celebrate their victories and to let them fail. You know, you know, I think that's a, it's a big one. It's really, it's really hard, but I think that's a big one. And I, I don't know, like I'm Stephen, who I mentioned, like when I met him on venture, he was so giving of his knowledge and time um, about the industry, about cartooning that like, it was amazing. And so like now, um, I don't even know if I ever thought about teaching before meeting him in a real way. And then I real like, it was so awesome to learn so much from someone that like, I was like, I want to give that to other people. I want to be available and I want to like be excited and, and give that, give that to others. So I think it's important. Even as an animatic editor, I've had a chance to um, pitch ideas if something's not in the room isn't working. And um, it's always really like, like you both said, it's always really nice to, to get the chance to do that and, and have that support. <laughs> um, a few questions we've already answered. This is great that people keep asking questions. Yeah. Kim, what was the hardest job you had? Oh, well, I worked on a on a production that um, I won't even tell you who whose it was or where it was, but the show creator, who was a lovely person, just hadn't thought out what the show was about 100%. Mm. And they, I think that they greenlit it too fast, and it was a board-driven show. So I did, oh. also didn't have a board partner, so I was alone in a cube. They gave me um, a really, really rough outline of the show, of my episode, but even the characters weren't even 100% nailed down. So I didn't even know really who the characters were. So me and like the four other board artists, we all were doing our version of the show that we thought that it was. And then when we pitched it, the show creator would be like, okay, yeah, I, I like the direction you're going on with this character. And then the next board artist would pitch an entirely different version of that character and the show creator would be like, uh, yeah, I can see that being the character. And we'd be like, I was like in my cube, like crying. Like I, and then the director was completely lost too. So I'd go to the director's office and be like, can you help me like, like push apart this and figure out like how I can make this episode work. And he's like, I don't know. I mean, it was really awful. That was really, uh, awful. and then the whole production just got shut down. <laughs> oh, oh no <laughs> there were a lot of tears like like because i blame myself like i'm not good enough i'm terrible everyone else is getting this except for me and i that was actually probably the most depressed i've ever been in the industry where i was just like i this is pointless i'm terrible at this um it was really really bad it was really bad but it was interesting again like with every bad show i met some incredible people on that show that I, yeah. you know, like you just have to, I, I have a really hard time separating my work from my worth. And mm -hmm. that was a really tough one for me because it was like, when I'm failing at work, I am so miserable just in my home life. And it's really, really hard to keep that separate. So that was a really challenging time for me. How about you, Phil? What was your worst? Well, I didn't say worst. I said hardest. Oh, hardest. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I think my current job is the hardest job I've ever had. I think for sure. You know, I think it's a, it's, it's the biggest job I've ever had. Yeah. I, it's like, I think like the opportunity, it's the, it's the biggest opportunity, not just for me, but for like any place I've ever worked in terms of like what we're trying to do as we enter the industry and the way we are. Like I, there's definitely, um, like there's definitely a lot of pressure to get it right and to do right by you know by netflix by right by all of the amazing talent that's already at the studio and you know an industry that i love but i think can use improvement in lots of areas and i think we're trying to push for that so that's really hard and like you know i give people all the time the the you know the feedback about like you know when you it's not a, it's not about success or failure it's about what you do next it like i give that advice like it like it it spews out of me, I still struggle with taking it. So I have a lot of empathy that even when I give that advice to people, I know how hard it is to actually do that stuff. Um, it's really tough. And I, you know, 
uh, even today I was in a meeting where it was about that, about like pushing me to like, Phil, take your own advice, you know, yeah. and it's really true. <laughs> and it's, and it's, um, it's hard, but I love it, you know? So that's why I said, it's not, by no means is the worst job I've ever had. Um, but, uh, uh, it's the hardest, um, but it's exciting, you know, like I also though know that like, I don't like jobs that aren't hard. I, like, mm. I live in this weird conflicted place where like, I can be grumpy that they're yeah. hard, but. Um, I have this whole thing, like when I start a new job, if I'm not crying in the ladies room on the first <laughs> week, the job's not worth it. I kind of like it too. I like it. I like to be a little bit, <laughs> a little bit like, yeah, I don't know. It's like. Get some, get some spice going. Get some spice, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I got a few duplicate questions, so I was kind of weeding through those, and I'm trying to get a nice variety here. Um, uh, from Casey, uh, what's it like when you first start in the industry? Is someone there to help you adjust into the project, or are you thrown to the wolves on day one? Wow. Well, um, I'll, I'll be on, again, every studio is different, yeah. whatever, what, you know, wherever you're going. It depends have, on what show you're on, I guess. It depends on the yeah. show. It is, there is, there, it is, it is everyone's experience. And I will say that there are some that you will be thrown to the wolves and into the deep end. Mm -hmm. And there are some that you will be kind of slowly onboarded uh, in a big way. I think that the, like, and again, I talked about that fluctuation in the industry. Right now, there's a lot of opportunities. So that means yeah. there's a lot of opportunities for those of you who have never been professionals before. And all of the studios are working really hard to like, figure out how can you come in and succeed. So I, I think there's more, it's it's tough because I think there's a real need for people who can come in and hit the ground running. But yeah. luckily the studios all also know that like that's really hard to ask of people. So how do we build these things? I, you know, that job on Venture was fascinating because I was lucky I did a little bit of this work on that video game while I was still a student. I was a terrible student in art school. I really didn't go to classes. I, I tried to drop out, um, but my family, no. my parents wouldn't let me. I was not a good student. Um, but, you know, I got a job. I went and worked. So I worked at a small little place. But what was fascinating on Venture was I took a test, which I think test, I'm a very like pro testing person. I think testing can be really great for lots of people and responsible testing is the thing I talk about. Um, uh, but I took a test. So that's great because it gives you a little bit of sense of what some of the job might be. And then uh, at Noodle Soup Productions that was producing Venture, they did this thing that was like really smart, was they hired me not on the Venture Brothers, but to do some design work for um, Cocoa Puffs. They were bidding on, on like General Mills cereal stuff. So I went in for like a week or two to do some work uh, drawing Sunny from Cocoa Puffs. And, um, uh, and I did all of this work and I never worked at a studio before. And then what I learned was that they were assessing my professional aptitude. I don't know what I want to call it. They wanted to see how I work. They didn't know me. I just graduated school. I was an unknown person. Um, so Noodle Soup hired me to work on, on, on these things. Uh, and what was crazy was they hired another guy who had a lot of experience and, and uh, this designer named Chris George, he's amazing. Um, I learned so much working with Chris. Uh, and uh, uh, Chris and I were both working on this and we're both really different people had never met each other before. Um, and I, what I didn't know was that they were looking at us both for the Venture Brothers job, not in competition, but to work on the show. So they wanted to see how we worked together, what it was like, oh. you know, so, on venture, I got thrown in into the deep end because I had never really learned how to do a proper turnaround. I'd never really understood how to how to look at a script and, and glean what was in that as a designer. I didn't understand where my drawings needed to be to work inside of that system. But I was very lucky that they kind of assessed my professionalism and my ability to work with Chris. And then then they then they hired us on the show. So it was so nice. I think they even brought us both into the producer's office and they were like, hey, we want you to work on the Venture Brothers this last couple of weeks was to do this. And Chris was like, he kind of knew that that was happening. And I was like, what? Like, uh -huh. you know, but it was like classic first time person. I just had no idea. I saw people, let me, I'm sorry I'm rambling, but like this is paper days. 
I watched someone put a post-it note down on top of their drawing, adjust the drawing, and then take the post-it note down, go to the photocopier, photocopy a new drawing. And that was no longer had multiple pieces of paper. It was just a finished piece of art. And that's what they turned, and that's what Chris turned in. And I was like, what did you just do? And he was like, <laughs> I fixed this drawing and I used the photocopier to make it all flat. And I was like, we're allowed to do that? And he's like, yeah, there's not, doesn't have to be a perfect drawing. And then I was like, oh my God. Or I watched him, um, he was working on a character's face or something and he drew the body and he didn't draw the face, went to the photocopier, did mm -hmm. 10 photocopies. And all of a sudden we, when we had to draw like six army men or like whatever, spies, we, I was like, oh, I don't have to draw a brand new drawing every time. He's like, no, you just go <laughs> to the photocopier. And I was like, <laughs> Again, like no one in school telling you this stuff. And, and I was like, I'm allowed to use tools to get from point A to point B. It's not this like this romantic. Yeah. It's no, it it cheating, but it was, <laughs> and that was a good time to like get to know your coworkers waiting in line for the copy machine. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, uh, I've worked on shows where they were like, um, kind of throwing me right in there like yeah we needed an editor a week ago so you know <laughs> get, get hop to it please and then i've worked on stuff where they didn't have anything for me for the entire first month they didn't have any work for me to do and i was just kind of you know <laughs> and sitting around taking naps but uh yeah um yeah it depends on the show uh um and, Sorry. I want to add one thing. Sorry, Nico. Yeah, uh, yeah. My wife uh, uh, works in animation. She's uh, running DC Superhero Girls at Warner Brothers. She, uh, um, she, she went to school with J.G. Quintel, the creator mm -hmm. of Close Enough and uh, Regular Show. And J.G. was really good at that game Guitar Hero. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. um, and we have this thing that we say that's like totally like a, a joke about J.G. that I have learned. Um, he was great at it. And someone said to him, how did you get really good at it? And his answer was expert mode, dude. Like he never played it on anything but expert mode. So he like went into that without it on easy settings and intentionally dove into the deep end on that game. And like you, even if you're in the deep end or thrown to, thrown to the wolves, you learn really quick. Sure, yeah, yeah. You have to, and I love, and so we always <laughs> we call it expert mode, uh, and like we, you know, we do a JG impression when we talk about things. Yeah, really hard. expert mode, dude. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. He's such a Virgo. Um, to for both of you, uh, from Sylvester, what advice would you give to yourself back when you were building your portfolio and didn't know anyone in LA, and, uh, or didn't know anyone in the industry? What advice would you give your younger self? Hmm. I got it because I got really lucky and someone gave me this advice. So I'm going to, and I, and I try to give this advice to lots of people. My new, my New York portfolio had every page had like 30 drawings on it. It was like, how much can I show of myself? And um, this director, Randy Myers, who I worked with in New York, who ended up, um, he's an LA guy. When I showed him my portfolio, he was like, you can't, this is an awful portfolio. And I was like, why? And he was like, if you, and he said to me, if you want someone to look at one of your drawings, you can't surround it by 10 other drawings. Uh -huh. Like they may not look at what you want them to see. They're just going to see noise. Like mm. put less, put less work in your portfolio. Just make the work really impactful and give it room to breathe. And I love that advice because, you know, the truth was probably that I was hiding behind those drawings. I was filling all those pages because I was, I was nervous to say, this is my drawing. It was like, here's a lot of stuff. Maybe you'll find what you like. Yeah. Yeah. The point was like, you're just confusing people. Uh, huh. And I thought, what about, it was, no, what about people whose, whose portfolio is just kind of like their Instagram though? I guess that's like, you see the one image. So I, I don't, I mean, I got into the industry so long ago. It was a literal paper portfolio and I was Sue Rose. I worked for her in New York and she brought me to LA. So it was, I can't give any advice on how to break in, but um, do you think, cause I, I, now that I'm looking at artists' websites, it's nice to have a website where it's like the single image that you can click through. I have a whole thing. I'm going to do it. Do it. I think 
I think that people confuse things for portfolios. I think the word portfolio gets used to capture things that are not portfolios. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, I think a portfolio is the thing that you use to get a job. And I think your website or your Instagram, that is your body of work. Mm -hmm. They're different. You should have both. But like when you're applying for a job, if you know anything about that job or that studio, don't just send your Instagram, send your portfolio. And that portfolio is tuned for the eyeballs that might be seeing you. You know, so like curated for that type of show, yeah. put those images in there totally. and send and that link. Even if it's just organized differently, like, I, you know, I like, I became crazy about this. And, 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 you know, when I was trying to get my job on Adventure Time, I, I, I hadn't had to make a portfolio in a long time because I had moved from show to show. And I remember I was like, I'm going to do drawings specifically for pen. They weren't even like in my stuff. Like I yeah. sat down and was like, I'm doing drawings that I want Penn to see. And not only do I want him to see them, they're gonna be the first drawings in my portfolio. <laughs> and then I'm gonna get into some of my work and get through it. And then at the end of my portfolio, I'm gonna give him a couple more drawings I want him to see. So I was like, I'm gonna start for him, I'm gonna end for him, and then I'm gonna live with the rest of my work in the middle. But your portfolio should constantly change. You should be moving work in and out of it. You should be tuning it for different people. You know, if you're applying for a board job or a design job, they shouldn't be the same portfolio. You should do, if you're applying for a board job, make it 80% boarding, 20% your other stuff. If you're applying for a design job, make it 80% design and 20% your story um, work. You know, don't not show all of who you are, but like weight the way you present yourself to, to, to the audience. Um, Very good advice. That is, yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's, it's the worst when you want to look up an artist and it's like their personal blog and it's a lot of pictures, like photos of their dog or something. And you're just like, just get me to the drawings that I need to see to make the, yeah. Yeah. Someone's asking about separate Instagram page only for portfolio yeah. purposes. I think that that separate Instagram page, you should have it. It's not your portfolio. Call yeah. it your portfolio. Call it your portfolio, but don't think of it as this is the thing I send everyone. You are. You need to create something that is a. You know, I'm gonna. I love analogies. You need to put a piece of bait on your hook, and that bait may be different for every job out there. Yeah. So, so your Instagram page for your artwork that is great. That is a great place to showcase who you are in your body of work, but. If you are applying for a job, you know, on Summer Camp Island at Cartoon Network, the work in your portfolio should look different than if you're applying for a job on, you know, on Battle Kitty at Netflix. They are different tones of shows. You can learn a little bit about those shows. You can learn a little bit about the people who work on those shows. And then you, and then you, 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 you tweak it for, the, mm -hmm. for that audience. It is a lot of work. But like, think about what you're trying to do. You're trying to get a job and you're also trying to separate yourself from a lot of other people um, and put in that effort and energy. And you learn, you're like, oh, this worked or didn't work. Um, the job on Adventure Time, funny enough, uh, my portfolio wasn't the thing that got me there. There was one drawing in my sketchbook section that they really liked. And they like they were like this isn't that, and then I ended up having to do kind of multiple tests to get that to get that job also. And luckily, there was a director named Larry Likeletter who really believed in my work, um, who thought I could do it. Um, and Penn and Pat and Adam at the time were they liked what I did, but they weren't they didn't quite see it. They saw one drawing in my like kind of sketchbook section, um, but they weren't sure. And then but I got the ability to to take a couple of tests and prove to them that I could do it. Um, you know, but again, that page that was those sketchbook drawings totally in there because I thought Penn and Pat would like them. <laughs> they may not be have been there for other people. Yeah. I saw a question about life drawing. Did you do you did you put life drawing in there? I do because I love life drawing. And yeah. one of my my best instructor, well, I shouldn't say best instructor. Yeah, well, I think he was my best instructor, but one of my favorite classes at SVA was with James McMullen, who taught high focus drawing. He's an amazing illustrator. And that class like really helped me learn how to be an artist. 
Um, and, uh, and I love life drawing, so I did. But back on my portfolio, it's not a front and center thing. I think, you know, I think it's not the, you know, and it's funny because I like the application of life drawing and how it influences your, your cartooning is interesting, but people don't talk about that. You know, like people say, go out and do cafe drawings and do life drawing, but I don't know. There aren't, no teacher ever said to me, I never read anywhere. How do I make, how do I take that? And, and, and use what I'm learning there in my every day. And I don't think people teach that piece of it. Um, I have my own ideas about it, but uh, you know, I think it's not about your hand. I think it's about your eye um, when you're life drawing. You know? So the drawings are important, but it's not what your wrist is doing. It's about what you're seeing. Some of like, uh, I always think about Mike Roth, who was on um, JG's show regular show and I remember just like his life drawings were so good but it was like that made his like really rough like regular show drawings so good like just how like physicality like and he and I'd be like how did you figure that out and he'd be like life drawing dude life drawing because I'm terrible studied, at it so yeah. Mike studied under Stephen Gaffney who studied under James McMullen I had Mike and I both, who were SVA guys yeah all SVA New York yeah and Rebecca Kruger was an SVA person. She studied under Stephen Gaffney. You know, like, you know, I'm very yeah. proud of us SVA folk that have, um, have made it out here. I'm losing my voice, Nico. This is all fantastic advice. <laughs> well, we have 20 minutes left. Uh, I can't believe how fast that went. I'm, I'm, I, I feel really bad. We're not going get, to get uh, to everybody's questions, but I'll ask as many more as I can here. If you want to do a lightning round, Nico, we can also <laughs> lightning. You round. want to do a lightning round? Answers. Yeah. Let's we have 20 rounds. minutes. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's do like, let's do 10 minutes. Of, well, let's do, let's see, let's do five minutes of lightning round. <laughs> and okay. then we'll, we'll go every other Kim. You'll What's start. your favorite color, <laughs> Phil? Kim will start and then let's try to answer <laughs> quickly. Okay. Um, uh, 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 what would you recommend to someone? Uh, or, uh, what would you recommend to someone, or how would you handle someone who is not the best team player? That's you. You got to answer it, Kim. Okay. Uh, well, have you, you ever had to? Have you ever they, been in a situation where you are they self-aware? Because some people have no clue how crappy they are, sure, and they sure. kind of just eventually don't get hired. Yeah. So, it's like, if you are the asshole. <laughs> if you're out that you're the asshole. Just don't, just don't be an asshole. Yeah. But a lot of people have no, no, they can't tell if they're a dick or Yeah. Not. Can I, can you tag me in on that one too? Yeah. 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 Tag me in. Uh, I'll add to that, uh, the don't be an asshole, but if you're not a great team player, you better be the best solo artist. Yes. You better be an amazing you, artist. You can do it. If you could, you know, we, we have all talked about loving the team sport, but there are people who are best alone, and that's okay, but you got to be really good. you got to bring it. Next question. Next question. Um, uh, what would you say are the most drastic differences you have seen between different studios? Uh, drastic differences between studios. I would say um, the difference between TV and feature is really different. There's a pace yeah. difference. There's a different expectation in every department. Um, that's a big difference in terms of formats. Um, I would say like, you have to learn the language of each studio. Like what, what certain things are called one place or not what they're called other places. And a lot of times those are driven by production. So mm -hmm. you really need to get in there so that way you can get up to speed with that language. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, it's a lot of the same people going back and forth. That's mm -hmm. my answer. Anything to add, Kim? Uh, yeah, <laughs> Disney, you're, you're, you have to work for the Disney brand. So you'd have to take that on. Yeah, yeah. Some places, some studios are uh, different in terms of what you can and can't do. Like Disney is a little bit, uh, you tread a little bit lightly with their stuff because they are a big brand and yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Um, fun question. What's it like to work with well-known show creators, Pendleton Ward, Alex Hirsch, etc.? <laughs> What's it like? Oh, it's, you know, yeah. They're, uh, they're really, really smart, talented people that also, um, 
were I could learn from every day, but then also it was fun because both of them had less industry experience than I did. So like there was things that they got to learn from me um, and they pushed me in really different ways. So it was great. They're both amazing, but you know, people. I haven't worked with them, so. What's yeah. it like work with that? Maybe someday. Yeah. Um, Paul asks, uh, I guess this is for me, how many post positions, editors, assistant editors are usually on an animated show? Uh, usually there's two animatic editors, uh, there's an assistant editor, and there's one post editor. If it's a big, big show, maybe two post editors. Yeah. Um, and I would say in features, it's similar. It's like oh, a, yeah. It's like a four that's, that's for TV. Person. Sorry. Okay. Um, Allison asks, has working in the animation industry changed at all over the years compared to when you first started? For, yeah, I'd say for yeah, sure. Yeah, considering I'm <laughs> the, old, the old timer here. It was different. It was a different generation of people. When I first came in, it was like the old like Hanna-Barbera guys. Mm -hmm. like, you know, it was, it was an entirely different thing. I think um, it seems like uh, the boards were not as long. Their productions, the schedules seemed a little different. It was a different time. It was a definitely a different time. Um, I feel I think like there was a lot more a lot sexual harassment. Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. Um, uh, it was. Um, I, I feel like it's gotten much more sophisticated, and so with sophistication brings more thought. And I think it was it was a little bit more slapdash in the old days, but it was kind of fun in the old days. So I don't know. What do you think, Bill? Agreed. I think like the Saturday morning cartoon has gone right, and the set all the Saturday all the Saturday morning cartoon was a babysitter and a way to sell things. Yeah. So like yeah. you know, I think the 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 type of storytelling and animation has really gotten incredible. Um, there's amazing stuff happening every day and really important messaging that's happening across all you know audiences from preschool through adults from television to, through features. I think it's a it's a it's a medium that continues to mature. Um, the question was differences. Like, you know, I think technology plays a big part now. I think yeah. that before you didn't really, you know, like you had to know how to work with photocopier, you know, like that was the technology thing. A lot of it was the tools in front of you. And um, you hear a lot about people who couldn't make transitions from paper to d digital or going from traditional animation to CG animation. Like, I think that luckily, I think, a, you know, those of you that are on the younger side kind of grew up with technology and digital applications in a way that a lot of people didn't. Um, so that's important. I feel really lucky because I, I, I learned, you know, SVA wasn't teaching that stuff when I was there, but I took it onto myself to learn that stuff. And I think like when you learn that you can learn, then that's something you can kind of, you can apply that to whatever software you need to know. But there's definitely, of it, yeah. you know, that is new. Like the technical aspect is, you know, there always was a little bit of technical, but now there is definitely a. This is good to ask for, since you both are here, um, what advice would you give someone who wants to apply for Netflix? Well. There's so many needs. Um, <laughs> is check out netflixanimation.com. We have a job yeah. board there. Um, our recruitment team just did an amazing panel with Rise Up Animation on Monday. They're super active on social media. Check it out. Come, you know, back when you know when we're when we're back into the you know the the, the whatever the new normal is. Right? Mm -hmm. We'll you know come meet us at CTN, see us at events, seek us out share your work. Um, I think it's, I think that's tricky, you know, like, but you have to get your work in front of the recruiters and keep at it. Don't be, you know, be persistent, but don't be annoying. Yeah. You know? sure. Don't saturate your brand. Yeah. You know, don't send your work every five seconds yeah. and don't annoy people, you know, but like every couple months you got some new work you want to share. Yeah, show your growth. Send it through, send it through the recruitment. Uh, how do you relieve stress and anxiety when it, when you have projects with tight deadlines? You, I guess you remind yourself that you have rent um, <laughs> that needs to be paid. That's how, that's how I get through it. I think like, oh, I used to drink a lot, but I gave up that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yoga, running. 
I think reward yourself, you know, like I'm a gamer. So I would kind of yeah. give myself that, you know, I'm going to bust, I'm going to kill it. I'm going to work really hard power through this. And then this weekend, all I'm playing is yeah. like Mario Odyssey. And just, when it's done, just reward yourself. Yeah, yeah. I think it's totally fine. I and I think, um, yeah, I'm half kidding, but also, you know, when you have to do this for, for your job and you need money, <laughs> that, that, that's de that definitely uh, paying your rent is, is definitely a good motivator. motivator. <laughs> See, come on, lightning round. Uh, I kind of jumped around everywhere, so I'm trying to... Neeks. And we were like, we weren't quite lightning either. I don't know what, <laughs> this was like rain. We were like, the worst is like, we'll run out of questions and then it'll just be awkwardly like the next five, five minutes. Thunder round. Thunder. Is that even more than a static round? Yeah. We just shake our screens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Phil, uh, can you talk more about what happened to you when a show you worked on got trashed. Was it something that happened unexpectedly or was it something you were anticipating? Uh, uh, I'll take I guess have, you, have either of you worked on something that just got canned all of a sudden? Yeah, we both have. Yeah. I'll, give, I'll you know, I'd love to hear, I think I know what show you're talking about, Kim, so it'd be interesting. Yeah, it's just the one that I said before. And it was like one day we just like walked in and the, the, the head guy like said, emergency meeting in the conference yeah. room. And it yep. was like, Whole production has been shut down, go home. Yep. And we got paid for, I think the month, which was really nice, like, cause mm -hmm. it was such an emergency thing and they tried to put us on different shows. Um, Our experience I, was different. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Ours, they did, they, they were very kind to us, but. Uh, it's only happened to me once, but they were, we were just told the day of, didn't see it coming. I was, um, I got, I was really lucky. I. I was told on a Monday that Wednesday that I was told on a Monday that the, that the crew was going to find out on Tuesday um, and that Wednesday would be everyone's last day. Um, but they said they're telling, they told me and two other artists because the studio was like, we want to offer the three of you jobs um, mm. to stay at the studio, but, work, nice. but you're going to, but you're going to take a massive pay cut in order to stay, oh. um, which was not nice. And then, so I remember literally, um, the three of us didn't go back to our desks. We went to the bar. We, you know, like we walked down the street um, in New York, sat at a bar, and we just talked about like how we felt, and it was shocking. We were like, "How do we go back to our desks, knowing everyone's about to get fired?" Um, we Tuesday morning, we let everybody know. They told everyone to, you know, that, like to, like to basically end the day. Um, and I don't think we got paid throughout the week. I think well, maybe we no, we got paid Wednesday was our last day. It was the last payday, and then we had to we weren't allowed to take any of our work from the show. We were like, we were told the computers are all going to be locked down. Um, but some of us, you know, the studio was like, Hey, your work's going to get locked down. So if there's anything that you personal work that you guys have on these, on these work computers, you know, save them now. But it was awful. It was, it was terrible, you know, to be out literally on the street with 50 other people. And there were like two other animated shows hiring in New York and everyone's calling friends. Do you have something? Do you have something? Do you have something? So it was rough. I did not take that job at the studio that they wanted to keep me on. I went, I like, I went in for the next meeting that they wanted to have me in on, and I realized like it wasn't right for me. So mm -hmm. I ended up, um, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I said no to the opportunity. Good for you. You made the in the integrity choice rather than the fear choice. Mm. I think so. <laughs> I just, I just didn't want it. Wasn't abundance fun. rather than fear. That's good. I like that. Uh, here's something I'm wondering about too. With job postings now, it's assumed that it'll be remote work with the pandemic and everything. Uh, but are they still requiring employees to live in LA? Nope. Yeah, I don't think so. That'd be really good. For <laughs> I'd say use this pandemic to your advantage. If yes. you don't live in LA, still apply. <laughs> I think you know. I am. I am hopefully optimistic. That, that there will be a different way that we work with people once pandemic is over. You know, like I would- I, I think so too. I think so too. We've learned that we can kind of do this and maybe yeah. it would be great if we could only drive to work like a couple days a week. That'd be mm -hmm. better work-life balance. Yeah. 
I think I'm out of text questions. Uh, um, Tina or, or whoever's sending me questions. There's, an, there's advice here. Any advice on someone who wants to make a short film and use that to apply for a job? Uh, I got a lot of advice about this. Um, at CalArts, there's definitely a really strong history of filmmaking um, for all the animation students there. And um, they're really, really good to do. But like a lot of jobs in animation don't look at film at your filmmaking as that prerequisite. So what I recommend is like use make your film, tell your story, um, but take the elements from that production and use those to build yourself a portfolio. Because like I think I think getting your film in festivals is great. I think getting it seen, putting it on Vimeo, getting it on YouTube, getting it out to the world is an awesome thing to do. But um, uh, it's about the being a part of a production pipeline and your film shows your whole body of work versus it being about those specific things. But if your film is funny, that will help you get considered for story jobs on comedy shows. If your film is action packed and, and dramatic, it will help you get seen as a potential story artist for those shows. So like, again, like, it's, it's that separate the artist, auteur, and the commercial artist, you know, like you have to remember that it's, there's, there, they are, there is a Venn diagram where they overlap, but sometimes they do not overlap. I saw there was a question about writers too, like how to break in if you're a writer. That's a tough one. I, That's a, I get that one all the I time. Know, and I'm like, I'm, I, I, I'm still learning. I'm still trying to get, a, you know, a writing job. So, um, yeah, that, that is a tough one. Everyone wants to write. So it's really tough, I think. Well, then you said, Phil, too, like, they don't teach, like, writing for animation in school, which is, like, crazy. Because we've all probably worked on a show where there was a live action writer that came in to be a writer and they'd be like, and then the entire town shows up wearing Halloween costumes or something. And you're like, no, a designer would lose their mind. Like you, that doesn't work, you know? Yeah. So um, yeah, it's uh gosh, I wouldn't know what, to, what to, Oh, SCAD, they're saying SCAD is offering something. That's pretty mm. cool. See, maybe they're getting a, I think it's getting better. Yes, yeah. The so Second City Hollywood is writing for animation. Yeah, maybe just take a, one of those classes and submit <laughs> your scripts to us. You know. Um, th this is definitely uh, um, depends on the studio, but um, from Eric here, uh, what's usually the barrier to seeing LGBTQ subject matter in animation? I remember hearing about how even just a few years ago, showrunners would need to fight tooth and nail to put even the slightest hint of it in the work. Is this an executive thing or a standards and practices thing? Well, things, times are changing. Yeah. Keep your eyes tuned. Yeah, things are definitely changing. I think it's, um, I don't think you, it's, it's, more, it's more complex sometimes than an executive or a standards and practices thing. Mm -hmm. I think that like, um, you know, without going too into it, and this isn't, I don't, it's not right, is that like a lot of these shows are, are, are made to be broadcast in multiple countries. And yeah. in some countries are more, have, have a more open-minded and inclusive point of view on people. And it's really hard when these businesses are these big, big corporations that are in business in all these areas where you, you all of a sudden might be doing something that is not appropriate or even illegal. Yeah. In a country doesn't make it morally, you know, again, the, the morality behind it is, is tough, but like, again, those, those times are changing and I think it's really great um, for all the progress that, that a lot of shows have been making. And I'm, I'm excited to see where things are headed. We have a long way to go, but yeah. headed in the right direction. Um, when I was on, uh, when I was at Disney uh, working on star, we wanted to, do a lot but uh you know it's just uh it's it's just tough uh, especially at disney because it's a brand and um you know there's lots of countries that that don't like that so yeah. it's getting better yeah yeah but but like you said we have a long way to go <laughs> for sure um i think last question. To, yeah last question Give it a good one. 
It better be the best one. Okay, at some, give me a good question. Good last one, everybody. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Or <laughs> it is not, Phil. <laughs> Great. What is it then? It's just a hot dog. A hot dog is a sandwich. That's hilarious. That's crazy talk, Phil. <laughs> a hot dog is a taco. I love it. Is a taco a sandwich? I You're mean, right. Hot dog <laughs> is a version of a taco. Does pineapple belong on pizza? No. Oh, I don't Josh. I don't like it. Josh, can Phil tell his UFO story? Sorry. Can Phil Josh. tell his UFO story? Yes, I've been wanting to know that story for a long time. I still haven't heard it. Josh was one of my students at CalArts and has an incredible film. Look him up. Josh Swallow. I think it's on Vimeo. <laughs> okay. Everybody watch it. It's awesome. It's a little it's it's a little dark, but it's fantastic. Is using web comics a good way to apply for storyboard jobs? You know, uh, yeah, I think it is. I think it's a great, it's a great, it's it's a great thing in addition to storyboarding samples. Um, I think it's a great way to practice storytelling, right? Comics are a little bit different than storyboarding. Here's mm -hmm. something that I love that someone explained the difference between comics and boarding. Comics, you draw things when they're when they're in the middle of action. So like a punch yes. is like yeah. in the middle of action. Yeah. Storyboarding, you're drawing before the action and then after the action. Mm -hmm. So like the 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 mechanics are different, but the a lot of times web comics are great. I've seen people do amazing journal comics and they almost format them more like storyboards. And I think that's like a really interesting way to to do stuff. And I saw real quick best advice you would give to someone who wants to give up. I Don't know, give up. Professor, that breaks my heart. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, has I it just been a know. long, has it just been a long time and you're just not, I not guess, hitting anything or? I, you know, it's, here's the thing. It's like, you know, 29 we have, we have ideas, is old. <laughs> we have ideas of like what we think that we're supposed to do. Like yeah. if you're getting to a point in your life where you are starting to know yourself and you're knowing that it's not right for you, then give up. But if you d really think, no, this is really for me, I'd say just keep one, keep. Yeah. I don't think there's a, such a thing as oh you're too old to join animation. Oh, Sorry, no. I'm I'm 84. Have you ever have you ever heard the phrase that the journey is the destination? I really love that. Sure. I love that. And like I think it's I think people sometimes focus on where they're trying to go and they're not looking down at where they are. And like and it's it's like you know you may in your head think I want to work at Disney. But like, it's not about working at Disney. It's about like being creative mm -hmm. with other people. And there's lots of other ways to do it. So I think, I think sometimes it's about broadening your point of view, cutting yourself a little bit of slack, and then maybe looking in areas that maybe you weren't looking and maybe try to not be so hard on yourself um, to, get, to get through that. That's the church across the street. <laughs> it's Bill's. It's 6 p.m. It's 6 p.m. Phil and Kim, thank you both so thank much you. for being a part of this. Thank um, you. And thank you all to the audience uh, for, for hanging out. We got like, we got Keep like on. between 80 and 100 in our audience here today. So thank you so much. And thank you, CTN and Tina and everyone at CTN for helping out. Um, I think uh, the, in the next one we'll be talking about uh, working in the industry during a pandemic and uh, what's what that's sort of been like. <laughs> and I think we'll kind of uh, continue on with, you know, just working in the industry and all that. Uh, but um, yeah, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, uh, Thanks to everybody for yeah. being there with the great questions. <laughs> um, uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. <laughs> Ciao. Thanks.